Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be reviewing five more of the Penguin Mini Modern Classics. So I've already posted the first five of these, which I'll link to below. And we're just going to crack on, we're going to read the next five. And uh, there's 50 of them in total, so this brings us up to 20% of the way through. Now this is an Archive 5 video, so you should know if you've seen these before, that I'm going to put on the screen little timestamps for each of these, uh, where the reviews start. And that will also be in the description as well. Pro tip, you can actually speed it up as well and listen on like two times speed if you want to just blaze through the whole video and um, yeah today we are going to be taking a look at The Veiled Woman by Anais Nin, Notes on Nationalism by George Orwell, Food by Gertrude Stein, The Three Electro Knights by Stanislav Lem and The Great Hunger by Patrick Kavanagh. So yeah without further ado let's get reviewing these books. Yay. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Veiled Woman by Anais Nin, and this is Penguin Mini Modern number 6. So it says on the back here, Transgressive desires and sexual encounters are recounted in these four pieces from one of the greatest writers of erotic fiction. Now, obviously, I'm just working my way through the entire box set here. I'm not really an erotic fiction writer, but I will read it, especially when it's somebody like Nin who is like one of the iconic names in the field, I suppose. It says down here, uh, in the early 1940s, Anais Nin began writing erotica at a dollar a page for an unnamed collector. These pieces were later published in the 1970s. The Veiled Woman, Linda, and Marianne first appeared in the collection Delta of Venus, 1977, and Mandra in Little Birds, 1979. And we have our quote here at the front. So the quote for this one is, I like the hungry way she looks at me. Very nice. Okay, now I have very mixed feelings about this book because as a general rule, Nim's writing is pretty good. Like, it feels classical. It feels almost like, you know, a Hemingway or something like that at certain times of the plot. The problem is, is that it's erotica and there are just certain words that you shouldn't use and uh, the one that really bugs me, or one of the ones that really bugs me, is his sex or her sex to refer to genitals. And she used this constantly throughout, to the point at which I just could not get involved in the stories. So I'm going to read you part of this one from The Veiled Woman, which I actually feel as though I've heard the plot of this before. It, it's basically just a story about this this dude who basically gets invited to have sex with this woman in a hotel, I think it was. So um, I'm going to read you an excerpt because it, it, it feels like it's kind of building up steam and then it used her sex and just, I can't, it doesn't work for me at all. It's like using the word moist. Like, it just t takes me out of the story and I'm just like, oh, what am I doing? Why am I reading this? So, and why did she use this, like, annoying turn of phrase when quite a lot of it's well written. They stood near the bed without speaking. He passed his hands along the satin curves of her body, as if to become familiar with it. She was unmoved. He slipped slowly to his knees as he kissed and caressed her body. His fingers felt that under the dress she was naked. He led her to the edge of the bed and she sat down. He took off her slippers. He held her feet in his hands. By the way, that creeps me out because I don't like feet. Feet, just, oh. <laughs> she smiled at him gently and invitingly. He kissed her feet, oh it's getting really gross, and his hands ran under the folds of the long dress, feeling the smooth legs up to the thighs. She abandoned her feet to his hands, held them pressed against his chest now, while his hands ran up and down her legs under the dress. If her skin was so soft along the legs, what would it be then near her sex? There where it was always the softest. Her thighs were pressed together so he could not continue to explore. He stood and leaned over her to kiss her into a reclining position. As she lay back, her legs opened slightly. He moved his hands all over her body, as if to kindle each little part of it with his touch, stroking her again from shoulders to feet, before he tried to slide his hand between her legs, more open now, so that he could almost reach her sex. I just can't take it seriously. The next page. Then a strange thing happened, when he leaned over to feast his eyes on the beauty of her sex, its rosiness, it's not a fucking flower, mate. She quivered, and George almost cried out for joy. Then we have sex again. Her sex there. His sex there. So that's four times on one page. And I'm just like... Not only is this one of just the worst ways to describe genitalia. It just... 
is repeated over and over again. Like, all four stories in this are basically just the same of somebody running their hand over somebody else's body parts or whatever. The twist at the end of this was the woman he'd gone to have sex with or whatever. Uh, George's friend, George being the character, had paid to go and watch her have sex with him. So she didn't really want to have sex with him. I don't know. The problem is, is I don't. I just don't care when when the plot is purely about romance or purely about sex. Either way, it's just so boring to me. Oh, this one is. Uh, his hands gripped her like claws. He lifted her sex to meet his penis, as if he did not care if he broke her bones in doing so. So that's almost kind of rapey as well. Oh, here's another one. She feared that she would come at the very first touch of his finger on her sex. The lips of her sex were as stiff as if they had been caressed. Her nipples hard, her whole body quivered. And as he kissed her, he felt her turmoil and slipped his hand directly to her sex. Wait, she had turmoil? Oh, then we have an eight-year-old who's already having a lesbian affair with an older cousin. I'm just... I don't know. Maybe this is what life is like for other people, but... I mean, sex didn't even enter my mind till I was like 14. I kneel in front of her and put my hand on the hair between her legs. I stroke it gently, gently, and I say, The little silver fox! The little silver fox! So soft and beautiful. I'm just like, what? Oh, hang on. Her mouth is so wet, so inviting. The lips of her sex must be the same. Her sex tastes like a seashell. A wonderful, fresh, salty seashell. My fingers work more quickly. She falls back on the bed, offering her whole sex to me. It is rosy and new as if no one had ever touched it. It is like the sex of a young girl. Her sex is open. Now her hands travel downwards and join mine in caressing her own sex. She likes to be touched at the mouth of her sex. And while my tongue is playing there in the mouth of her sex, my fingers press into the flesh of her ass. I press it farther, all the while moving my tongue inside of her sex. I mean, that's all on one page. That was like eight in one page. I just don't understand how you can think that this is good. Like, it just really is not. <laughs> it really is not. We have somebody whose job it is to type up the erotica, so presumably the SZ and the X on the keyboard are worn away. Well, wait a minute. Now, don't get me wrong, like I say, bits of the writing, when she wasn't just talking about somebody rubbing somebody else's sex, was actually pretty good, but just because of the sheer repetitiveness, I'm sure you can tell from me reading this out to you, I mean, this is what, this entire book is 55 pages long, and the number of times she just used that repetitive phrase, his slash her sex, which I hate at the best of times, like, one or two uses of that would have taken this down to a 3 out of 5 for me. The sheer number that she used of it. I think I gave it a 2 out of 5 at the time. Do you know what? It's just winding me up so much. No, I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to give it a 2 out of 5. Because there were some redeeming elements in the bits of the story where it wasn't actually about erotica. Which is kind of, kind of entertaining, I think, really. But... I mean, yeah, she's supposed to be one of the great writers of erotic fiction. Maybe she was one of the earliest writers of erotic fiction. But having dabbled with the genre here and there myself, I can confirm that it is not normal to use his slash her sex that many times. People still do use it a lot and it still bothers me, but I don't know. What can you do? I almost think it's childish to write like that. Just, like, write how people speak. Well, anyway, that's what I thought of The Veiled Woman by Anais Nin, so don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this, and if not, whether you're going to be picking it up, I guess, if you have a his slash her sex fetish. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this review, hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Notes on Nationalism by George Orwell. So this is Penguin Mini Modern Classic number 7. I'm going to read you the blurb on the back here. So it says... Biting and timeless reflections on patriotism, prejudice and power from the man who wrote about his nation better than anyone. And inside we have this little quote here. Nationalism is inseparable from the desire for power. So I guess I'm quite a big George Orwell fan really. I've read most of his work now. I know his name is Eric Arthur Blair off the top of my head, which I guess a lot of people don't necessarily know. But um, this one, obviously, I was getting, I was quite excited to read because it's in this Penguin Mini Moderns range. These are all taken from Orwell's essays, and basically there are three in here. So there's notes on nationalism, anti-Semitism in Britain, and the sporting spirit. 
And I guess if you bear in mind that these... So these were all written in 1945, just towards the end of the Second World War. And so I think that makes them kind of super relevant for when they were written. But actually, they're still very relevant today as well. So I'm going to go through and read some of the bits that I found particularly interesting and that I think are, you know, particularly relevant for our modern age. And he kind of compares here as well, he talks about nationalism and kind of compares it to patriotism, except it's not really patriotism. Um, let me see if I can find where he clarifies it. So he says here, By nationalism, I mean first of all the habit of assuming that human beings can be classified like insects, and that whole blocks of millions or tens of millions of people can be confidently labelled good or bad. But secondly, and this is much more important, I mean the habit of identifying oneself with a single nation or other unit, placing it beyond good and evil and recognising no other duty than that of advancing its interests. Nationalism is not to be confused with patriotism. Both words are normally used in so vague a way that any definition is liable to be challenged. But one must draw a distinction between them, since two different and even opposing ideas are involved. By patriotism, I mean devotion to a particular place and a particular way of life, which one believes to be the best in the world, but has no wish to force upon other people. Patriotism is of its nature defensive, both militarily and culturally. Nationalism, on the other hand, is inseparable from the desire for power. The abiding purpose of every nationalist is to secure more power and more prestige, not for himself, but for the nation or other unit in which he has chosen to sink his own individuality. And obviously then he compare, he talks about Germany and Japan as being both highly nationalist countries. So he talks about obsession, he says, As nearly as possible, no nationalist ever thinks, talks, or writes about anything except the superiority of his own power unit. It is difficult, if not impossible, for any nationalist to conceal his allegiance. The smallest slur upon his own unit, or any implied praise of a rival organisation, fills him with uneasiness which he can only relieve by making some sharp retort. If the chosen unit is an actual country, such as Ireland or India, he will generally claim superiority for it, not only in military power and political virtue, but in art, literature, sport, the structure of the language, the physical beauty of the inhabitants, and perhaps even in climate, scenery and cooking. He will show great sensitiveness about such things as the correct display of flags, relative size of headlines and the order in which different countries are named. And then there's a footnote. Certain Americans have expressed dissatisfaction because Anglo-American is the normal form of combination of these two words. It has been proposed to substitute Americo-British. Nomenclature plays a very important part in nationalist thought. Countries which have won their independence or gone through a nationalist revolution usually change their names, and any country or other unit round which strong feelings resolve is likely to have several names, each of them carrying a different implication. The two sides in the Spanish Civil War had between them nine or ten names expressing different degrees of love and hatred. Some of those names, example patriots for Franco supporters, or loyalists for government supporters, were frankly question-begging, and there was no single one of them which the two rival factions could have agreed to use. All nationalists consider it a duty to spread their own language to the detriment of rival languages, and among English speakers this struggle reappears in subtler form as a struggle between dialects. Anglophobe Americans will refuse to use a slang phrase if they know it to be of British origin, and the conflict between Latinizers and Germanizers often has nationalist motives behind it. Scottish nationalists insist on the superiority of Lowland Scots, and socialists, whose nationalism takes the form of a class hatred tirade against the BBC accent and even the broad A. One could multiply instances. Nationalist thought often gives the impression of being tinged by belief in sympathetic magic, a belief which probably comes out in the widespread custom of burning political enemies in effigy or using pictures of them as targets in shooting galleries. So I guess you can kind of see why I think this is still relevant today. Another great bit here is this, this bit about indifference to reality. All nationalists have the power of not seeing resemblances between similar sets of facts. A British Tory will defend self-determination in Europe and oppose it in India with no feeling of inconsistency. Actions are held to be good or bad, not on their own merits but according to who does them, and there is almost no kind of outrage, torture, the use of hostages, forced labour, mass deportation, imprisonment without trial, forgery, assassination, the bombing of civilians, which does not change its moral colour when it is committed by our side. We've got down here. The nationalist not only does not disapprove of atrocities committed by his own side, but he has a remarkable capacity for not even hearing about them. For quite six years, the English admirers of Hitler contrived not to learn of the existence of Dachau and Buchenwald. 
and those who are loudest in denouncing the German concentration camps are often quite unaware, or only very dimly aware, that there are also concentration camps in Russia. Huge events like the Ukraine famine of 1933 involving the deaths of millions of people have actually escaped the attention of the majority of English Russophiles. Many English people have heard almost nothing about the extermination of German and Polish Jews during the present war. Their own anti-Semitism has caused this vast crime to bounce off their consciousness. In nationalist thought there are facts which are both true and untrue, known and unknown. A known fact may be so unbearable that it is habitually pushed aside and not allowed to enter into logical processes, or on the other hand it may enter into every calculation and yet never be admitted as a fact, even in one's own mind. We've got down here a quote. All nationalist controversy is at the debating society level. It is always entirely inconclusive, since each contestant invariably believes himself to have won the victory. Some nationalists are not far from schizophrenia, living quite happily amid dreams of power and conquest, which have no connection with the physical world. We've got here he lists five types of nationalist. Uh, and it says, I list below five types of nationalists, and against each I append a fact which it is impossible for that type of nationalist to accept, even in his secret thoughts. So, British Tory. Britain will come out of this war with reduced power and prestige. Communist. If she had not been aided by Britain and America, Russia would have been defeated by Germany. Irish nationalist. Era can only remain independent because of British protection. Trotskyist. The Stalin regime is accepted by the Russian masses. Pacifist. Those who abjure violence can only do so because others are committing violence on their behalf. And he says, all of these facts are grossly obvious if one's emotions do not happen to be involved. But to the kind of person named in each case, they are also intolerable, and so they have to be denied, and false theories constructed upon their denial. I personally am a pacifist, though, and I don't consider myself to also be a nationalist, so... And actually, I do accept what Orwell says. You know, other people, other people have died so that I can be a pacifist. What I like here is the way this essay ends as well, so he says... As for the nationalistic loves and hatreds that I have spoken of, they are part of the makeup of most of us, whether we like it or not. Whether it is possible to get rid of them, I do not know, but I do believe that it is possible to struggle against them, and that this is essentially a moral effort. It is a question, first of all, of discovering what one really is, what one's own feelings really are, and then of making allowance for the inevitable bias. If you hate and fear Russia, if you are jealous of the wealth and power of America, if you despise Jews, if you have a sentiment of inferiority towards the British ruling class, you cannot get rid of those feelings simply by taking thought. But you can at least recognise that you have them, and prevent them from contaminating your mental processes. The emotional urges which are inescapable, and are perhaps even necessary to political action, should be able to exist side by side with an acceptance of reality. But this, I repeat, needs a moral effort, and contemporary English literature, so far as it is alive at all to the major issues of our time, shows how few of us are prepared to make it. I'm not going to go too far into the other essays in this collection. There's also anti-Semitism in Britain. What I am going to read is a couple of these examples he gave. He says, um... Here are some examples of anti-Semitic remarks that have been made to me during the past year or two. Middle-aged office employee. I generally come to work by bus. It takes longer, but I don't care about using the underground from Golders Green nowadays. There's too many of the chosen race travelling on that line. Tobacconist woman. No, I've got no matches for you. I should try the lady down the street. She's always got matches. One of the chosen race, you see. I do sometimes wonder where these people even, like... Don't get me wrong, I get that Orwell is writing down what these people are actually saying, and these are based on real people, but it makes me just wonder about people sometimes. So, this quote here, uh, Intelligent woman on being offered a book dealing with anti-Semitism and German atrocities. Don't show it to me. Please don't show it to me. It'll only make me hate the Jews more than ever. And the crazy thing is, is that people like that really did exist, and, even crazier, they still frickin' do as well. Crazy Madness, Crazy Crazingtons. And then anyway, and then the final essay in this is one called The Sporting Spirit. And basically that's all about sport and how it makes us very tribal as people. I mean, the, even if you think about like games between freaking Celtic and Rangers or, or whatever in uh, Scotland. Like those, those football matches used to be war zones. And like you have football firms who literally go to watch football matches just so they can fight each other because they like to fight, you know. I mean, they're not just 
picking up random people on the street and beating the shit out of them. They're, they're picking fights with other people who also want to fight. And, and Orwell makes this really great argument in this way. He's like, the single worst thing that could happen right now is a big football match between England and Russia. I think there was even one was even organised. And what's great as well, there was some argument... I think that was it. The, the, this Russian team... So it wasn't the national team, but this Russian team came over and played like Arsenal or whatever. And there was this argument because the Russians were trying to say they were playing an all English team. And the English were saying, no, you're just playing a team from the English league because it's Arsenal. Of course, they've got foreigners playing for them, even though it was 1945 at the time. So he does make this great point. He's like, when there's really unstable political situations, the last thing you want, like in the world right now, for example, there's a bit of tension between Russia and the UK because of the uh, former Russian spy who was poisoned, who was probably poisoned by ISIS. When you've got tension between the UK and Russia, the last thing you want is the English national team playing the Russian national team in Moscow or whatever. That's just going to get people even more annoyed. <laughs> and, and Orwell kind of argued that. So I think actually it does say down here these are like biting and timeless reflections on patriotism. And it is definitely very timeless. In fact, I'd argue it's almost as relevant now as it was in 1945 when he wrote it. And for that alone, it's perfect to be in these Penguin Modern Minis. And I think it's the perfect representation of Orwell as a writer as well. I was very happy with this one. I think I might have given this a 4 out of 5 when I read it. But now going back through it, I've got to give this a 5 out of 5. This is just... I think everyone should read this. It's the kind of book that just broadens your mind, you know. And if you've never read any Orwell before... Other than maybe picking up Animal Farm, this is probably the single best introduction to him as a writer that I can think of. So yeah, check it out. Five out of five for me. And this is Notes on Nationalism by George Orwell. So anyway, on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and or if you've read any Orwell. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Hi guys, Dane here. And today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Food by Gertrude Stein. So this is number eight in the Penguin Modern Classic series. I'm going to read the back to you here. From apples to artichokes, these glittering, fragmented, painterly portraits of food by the avant-garde pioneer Gertrude Stein are redolent of sex, laughter, and the joy of everyday life. Now, straight away, what I'm going to say about this is I've looked at the other reviews that people have posted on online and uh, on, on Goodreads and on Amazon, and... Basically, it seems as though a lot of the reviews are from people who've picked this book up without knowing anything about Gertrude Stein going into it. So, as it says on the back, Gertrude Stein is an avant-garde writer. People on the uh, in their reviews kind of said, oh, it reminded me of, you know, some college student writing something and being super pretentious and thinking they're really arty, but really it's just nonsense. And it's like... Even if that's the case, that entire archetype came around because Gertrude Stein started writing like that and she started pushing the boundaries, you know, breaking down the barriers and just writing really weird stuff. I'm going to read you a few bits that I highlighted. So what Stein does well here is shows how food in itself plays a huge part in our lives. I mean, it brings people together. We eat together around the tables, for example. Stein really is not for you unless you want to try some really avant-garde sort of prose poetry almost. And... I mean, it's one of those things where I kind of quite like dipping in and out of her work. I wouldn't want to read loads of it. This is actually the perfect size, if you ask me. I'm going to read you... Uh, let's read this. This, I guess, is the contents page. Okay, well, this is the contents page, and it actually reads like one of her poems. So, roast beef, mutton, breakfast, sugar, cranberries, milk, eggs, apple, tails, lunch, cups, rhubarb, single fish... Cake, custard, potatoes, asparagus, butter, end of summer, sausages, celery, veal, vegetable, cooking, chicken, pastry, cream, cucumber, dinner, dining, eating, salad, sauce, salmon, orange, cocoa and clear soup and oranges and oatmeal, salad dressing and an artichoke, a centre in a table. That really is like one of her poems. And they're all different sizes as well, so... It actually seems to get almost shorter as we go through. I'm going to read you this one. This is, this is Apple. Apple plum, carpet steak, seed clam, coloured wine, calm scene, cold cream, best shake, potato, potato and no no gold work with pet, a green scene is called bacon change, sweet is bready, a little piece, a little piece please, a little piece please, come again to the presupposed and ready eucalyptus tree, count out sherry and ripe plates and little corners of a kind of ham, this is use. So as you can see, if you pick this up expecting 
you know, William Wordsworth style poetry, you are going to be deeply confused, I think is probably the word here. So I guess what's interesting about Stein, again, is the whole point of her approach just being so different. It's almost, if you think of art and uh, art, I suppose at the time of around when she lived. So she was born in 1874 and died in 1946. You can kind of see how painters like Picasso and Pollock and all of these new wave of artists, even people like Marcel Duchamp, I mean, there's not an exact overlap of when this was happening, but there's the same trend in art and in literature when for hundreds of years it was very much, you know, landscapes and portraits and all of this stuff, and in literature it was very much traditional rhyming poetry, maybe the odd novel, plays, all of that kind of thing. And then at the turn of the 20th century, people start to experiment more so you see that in art but you see it in literature too so for me stein is just like one of those mad artists who did really weird stuff that people weren't sure whether it was art or not and i still don't know whether it's art or not but that's why i read her stuff you know i think immediately dismissing it is just dismissing a whole approach to literature i think it's just saying no actually i like my poems in a certain way and i like my novels in a certain way and there is no other way of doing it and i just think that's uh you know it's a closed-minded way of thinking i think you should read stuff like gertrude stein just to see what is possible with a written word we could do some more readings here potatoes real potatoes cut in between potatoes in the preparation of cheese, in the preparation of crackers, in the preparation of butter, in it. Roast potatoes. Roast potatoes for. Asparagus. Asparagus in a lean, in a lean too hot. This makes it art and it is wet, wet, weather, wet, weather, wet. This makes it art. See, it's coming from Gertrude's mouth herself. I'm going to show this to you as well as you can kind of see. Like I say, some of the earlier ones in this are kind of super dense. Let's read you a bit of this one, a bit of breakfast. I'm not going to read the whole thing. A change, a final change includes potatoes. This is no authority for the abuse of cheese. What language can instruct any fellow? A shining breakfast, a breakfast shining. No dispute, no practice, nothing, nothing at all. A sudden slice changes the whole plate. It does so suddenly. An imitation, more imitation, imitations succeed imitations, anything that is decent, anything that is present, a calm and a cook and more singularly still a shelter, all these show the need of clamour, what is the custom, the custom is in the centre. And again, I think it does actually help to read some of these poems out loud as well. Some of them almost sound deep even though they're almost like nonsense and that's another thing as well is that people seem quicker to dismiss work like Gertrude Stein's work than stuff like Jabberwocky by, uh, I forgot his name then, Lewis Carroll. That's awful, I know that poem by art. Was Brillig and the Slithy Toes did Gyre and Gimble in the Wabe? I mean, what's the difference between that and dining? Dining is West. And there's one here called Salad and it just goes, it is a winning cake. So all in all, Gertrude Stein's work isn't for everyone, but I mean, I studied it at uni as well, so that potentially gives me some kind of other little insights. I mean, I actually don't remember studying at a uni, but I do remember enjoying it at the time. And even though it is nonsensical and it kind of messes with your brain, it is still a lot of fun. I still think it holds up. I mean, this is the kind of book you want to read if you've just taken LSD or something, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. I mean, I don't think it's a 5 out of 5 book. I don't think a book like this can be, but I do think it was certainly thought provoking. It was nice to go back in and read some of her stuff. I mean, this is actually an excerpt from uh, Tender Buttons in 1914. I enjoyed this and I definitely think it was a worthwhile addition to the Penguin Classics, Penguin Mini Modern Classics range. I mean, you got to bear in mind all this was in like 1920 or something when nobody wrote like that, you know. Maybe hipsters do it on Wattpad and Tumblr all the time these days, but back in back in the day Nobody wrote like that and it was a breath of fresh air. So that's what I thought of food by Gertrude Stein Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this or indeed if you've read any of Gertrude Stein's stuff Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video hit subscribe for more bookish videos and I'll see you soon for another one Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Three Electro Knights by Stanislav Lem. Now, this is Penguin Mini Modern number 9. I'm going to read you the blurb here, as usual. So, 
From a giant of 20th century science fiction, these four miniature space epics feature crazy inventors, surreal worlds, robot kings, and madcap machines. And we have in the front here, our quote is, What use to a being that lives beneath the sun are jewels of gas and silver stars of ice? So it says here, stories taken from Mortal Engines, and our stories in this edition are The Three Electro Knights, the titular story, The White Death, King Globears and the Sages, and The Tale of King Nuff. Now, I'm going to give you some other little bits of info here. So, for example, Lem, he was a Polish author. Uh, he was born in 1921 and died in 2006. And the stories in this collection are translated by Michael Kandel. What I like about these stories is they have this sort of feel to them that makes them feel almost like fables. They're like, uh, you know, almost like stories with a moral to them. And I think that's what Lev is so good at is that he's, he kind of, you know, he's writing speculative science fiction effectively, but he writes it in such a way that it almost feels as though it's already happened and it's like historical. It's almost like biblical in a sense. I'm going to read you the first few sentences of the three Electro Knights to give you a feel for that. So... Once there lived a certain great inventor constructor who, never flagging, thought up unusual devices and fashioned the most amazing mechanisms. He built himself a digital midget widget that sweetly sang, and he named it a bird. The three Electro Knights' the story itself is almost steampunk as well. The third Electro Knight's called Quartz, and it says, uh, he in the day appeared as a polished lens and at night as a mirror filled with stars. He did not fear that the oil in his limbs would congeal, for he hadn't any nor that the ice flows would crack beneath his feet, for he could become as cold as he liked. There was one thing only he had to avoid, and this was prolonged thought, for it made his quartz brain grow warm, and that could destroy him. And I wonder whether Terry Pratchett's read this, because that reminds me of the trolls in Pratchett's Discworld, where, you know, I think it's Sergeant Detritus, he even has a specially made hat to keep his head cool so that his brain can work properly and there was like a scene in one of the books where all these trolls were in this like frozen meat warehouse and because they were in this frozen meat warehouse and it was cold in there they all became super intelligent and then it's just when they get back outside again into the warmth that they just become derpy and trollish i guess it does give me this biblical feel let me read you this quote that gave you gave me that feel as well so Infinite is the power of those pallid beings, that if they die, they are reborn anew countless times, far from the mighty suns. Carry out your orders, O oh atomizers. The wise ones and the scientists were greatly troubled when they heard these words. Still, they did not believe the prophecy of doom, for its likelihood seemed to them remote. Nevertheless, they lifted the entire ship from its resting place, smashed it on anvils of platinum, and, when it fell apart, immersed the pieces in heavy radiation so that it was reduced to a myriad of flying atoms, which keep eternal silence, for atoms have no history. All are equal to each other, whether they come from the strongest of stars or from dead planets or intelligent beings, both good and evil, because matter is the same throughout the universe and no one need have fear of it. I just really enjoyed his writing style. We have, with King Globears and the Sages, what I like about that is the story set up, basically these sages are begging the king not to behead them. And the king is like, I will spare you if you can say something that surprises me. And I, I, it had, uh, it almost felt like the Thousand and One Nights, like a, almost like a retelling of that. I'm going to read you this long old little paragraph here, but I think this is kind of relevant to today's world. Behold and hearken, everything that is, is ridiculed. No station, however high, is proof against ridicule, for there always will be ones who mock even the majesty of a king. Laughter strikes at thrones and realms. Nations make fun of other nations, or of themselves. It even happens that fun is made of what does not exist. Have not mythological gods been laughed at? Even things grimly serious and solemn, tragic even, oftentimes become the butt of jokes. You have but to think of graveyard humour, the jests concerning death and the deceased, and the heavenly bodies themselves have not been spared this treatment. Take for example the sun or the moon. The moon is now and then depicted as a skinny character with a drooping fool's cap and a chin that sticks out like a sickle, while the sun is a fat-faced friendly Humpty Dumpty in a tussled aureola. And yet, though the kingdoms of both life and death serve as objects of ridicule and things both great and small, there is something at which no one has yet had the courage to laugh or jeer. Nor is this thing the sort which one might easily forget or fail to notice, for I am speaking here of everything that exists, in other words, the universe. Yet if you think upon it, O King, you will see how very ludicrous is the universe. Basically, this is where the, the third of the sages is trying to surprise the king. And uh, spoiler alert, it does work. What I like here is um, 
talks about whether stars themselves are significant, he says. But size alone cannot decide the significance of a phenomenon. Do the scribblings of a cretin, transferred from a sheet of paper to a broad plane, become thereby momentous? Stupidity multiplied does not cease to be stupidity, only its ludicrousness is increased. And the universe, what is it but a scribble of random dots? Wherever you go, wherever you look, however far you go, this and nothing else. The monotony of creation would seem to be the most crass and uninspired idea one could possibly imagine. A dotted nothingness going on and on into infinity. Who would contrive such a witless thing if it had yet to be created? And then that story as well, it ends very interestingly. So the last little paragraph... Uh, Science does not concern itself with those properties of existence to which ridiculousness belongs. Science explains the world, but only art can reconcile us to it. What do we really know about the origin of the universe? A blank so wide can be filled with myths and legends. I wished, in my mythologizing, to reach the limits of improbability, and I believe that I came close. You know this already, therefore what you really wanted to ask was if the universe is indeed ludicrous. But that question each must answer for himself. I just think there's a lot of really interesting sort of philosophical questions in here. And then this final story, the tale of King, uh, tale of King Nuff. What's interesting about this one is that the, the premise itself is just very odd. Basically, the king decides to build this sort of extra corporeal presence. Like he, he make, basically makes the palace an extension of himself and then it gets bigger. And so then he starts taking over the city until eventually he rules over himself. Like... He, his physical presence is the entire sort of royal citadel and the city surrounding it. But there are no other people there. There's just him. And I thought that was quite interesting. And then uh, it ends in an interesting way as well. Basically, there's a fire, which, as you can imagine, that kind of screws you up when, you know, your physical presence is a city. So all in all, I really enjoyed this. I thought this was very interesting to read. I'd never le read any Stanislav Lem before, and I'm totally glad that I have. I mean, his writing, I would say, is on a par with someone like Asimov or someone like that. Uh, Carol Kapek, as well, is another great science fiction writer. I would have liked to have seen Kapek and or Asimov in this collection. I think it's almost weird to have Lem, but not Asimov. However... I still really enjoyed it. I'm definitely glad I picked this up. And if you've never read any Stanislav Lem before, but you're a sci-fi fan, this is a no-brainer. Go out and get this. As for rating, I'm going to give this a pretty solid 4 out of 5. It could be a 4.5, but I'm trying to be, be a bit harsher with my reviews because otherwise, if everything's high, it, it makes no sense, you know. But I did genuinely enjoy reading this. This was a pleasure. And I hope you check it out. There we have it. That's what I thought of The Three Electro Knights by Stanislav Lem. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this. And if not, whether you'll be picking it up. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Subscribe for more. And I will see you soon in another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Today, I am watching Jean from Bookish Thoughts. Hey, Jean. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Great Hunger by Patrick Kavanagh. So, this is book number 10 in the Penguin Mini Modern Classic series. I'm going to read you the blurb here. By turns tragic and comic, irascible and exalted, these are some of the best love poems by a writer who transformed Irish verse. So, I was looking him up online, actually. He died in 1967, so, you know, he's been gone a fair old while. But despite that, I mean... Th these poems are a great little bridge between sort of classic poetry and modern poetry in that, you know, sometimes they still use things like rhyming and traditional structures, but they also investigate more kind of stuff that we would be familiar with in our modern lives. I mean, who, who these days has any experience of wandering lonely as a cloud, you know? So in the front here where we have the little quote, it says, thank you sincerely for giving me my madness back or nearly. So that's a kind of, I delivered that line very badly, but that's a kind of example of what his work's like. So here we go. Uh, born 1904 in Inniskeen, Ireland. Died 1967 in Dublin, Ireland. And it says, This selection spans three decades of Patrick Kavanagh's writing life from 1930 to 1959. It has been taken from collected poems, edited by Antoinette Quinn, published in Penguin Modern Classics in 2005. I tell you what, I might as well tell you what poems are included in this as well. So we've got Ploughman, Inniskeen Road, July Evening, Shanko Duff, To the Man After the Harrow, The Great Hunger, which is obviously the title poem and it's quite a long one as well, about 30 odd pages. Consider the Grass Growing, Pegasus, In Memory of My Mother, Kerr's Ass, Innocence Epic, The Hospital, October, Come Dance with Kitty Stobling, To Hell with Common Sense, 
from Living in the Country and Canal Bank Walk. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read you a few excerpts. I'll get a few from The Great Hunger first. And just to give you a sense of his writing style, really. Men build their heavens as they build their circles of friends. God is in the bits and pieces of every day. A kiss here and a laugh again, and sometimes tears. A pearl necklace round the neck of poverty. He sat on the railway slope and watched the evening, too beautifully perfect to use. And his three wishes were three stones, too sharp to sit on, too hard to carve. Three frozen idols of a speechless muse. A year passed and another hurried after it, and Patrick Maguire was still six months behind life, his mother six months ahead of it, his sister straddle-legged across it, one leg in hell and the other in heaven, and between the purgatory of middle-aged virginity, she prayed for release to heaven or hell. His mother's voice grew thinner like a rust-worn knife, but it cut more venomously as it thinned. It cut him up the middle till he became more woman than man, and it cut through to his mind before the end. Another field whitened in the April air, and the harrows rattled over the seed. He gathered the loose stones off the ridges carefully, and grumbled to his men to hurry. He looked like a man who could give advice to foolish young fellows. He was forty-seven, and there was depth in his jaw, and his voice was the voice of a great cattle dealer, a man with whom the fair green gods break even. I think I ploughed that lee the proper depth. She ought to give a crop if any land gives. Drive slower with the foal mare, Joe. Joe, a young man of imagined wives, smiled to himself and answered like a slave. You needn't fear or fret, I'm taking her as easy as, as easy as, easy there Fanny, easy pet. Which kind of refers back to, to the Ireland setting I suppose. The schoolgirls passed his house laughing every morning, and sometimes they spoke to him familiarly. He had an idea, schoolgirls of thirteen would see no political intrigue in an old man's friendship. Love, the heifer waiting to be nosed by the old bull. That notion passed too. There was the danger of talk, and jails are narrower than the five sod ridge, and colder than the black hills facing Armagh in February. He sinned over the warm ashes again, and his crime, the law's long arm could not serve with time. So yeah, I mean, I really like his way with words. I do think this poem is a little bit long, I'm not gonna lie. I like this stanza here because... Uh, he manages to, to rhyme hobo with oboe, which considering he died in 1967 as well, I would have thought hobo was probably less in use then than it is now, but maybe not, who knows. To sing the gospel of life to a music as flightily tangent as a tune on an oboe, and the serious look of the fields will have changed to the leer of a hobo, swaggering celestially home to his three wishes granted. Will that be? Will that be? Or is an earth right that laughs ha ha, and does not believe in an unearthly law? The earth that says Patrick Maguire, the old peasant, can neither be damned nor glorified. The graveyard in which he will lie will be just a deep drilled potato field where the seed gets no chance to come through to the fun of the sun the tongue in his mouth is the root of a you silence silence the story is done so what i will say i actually preferred his shorter poems really because i think it allowed him to investigate more different concepts and ideas in a shorter period of time i'm going to read one of those here for you which is called october and then i'm going to give it my rating so october O oh, leafy yellowness you create for me, a world that was and now is poised above time. I do not need to puzzle out eternity as I walk this arboreal street on the edge of a town. The breeze too, even the temperature and pattern of movement is precisely the same. As broke my heart for youth passing, now I am sure of something, something will be mine wherever I am. I want to throw myself on the public street without caring for anything but the praying that the earth offers. It is October over all my life and the light is staring as it caught me once in a plantation by the fox coverts. A man is ploughing ground for winter wheat and my 19 years weigh heavily on my feet. Is that a, uh, is that a sonnet? It's kind of a sonnet, isn't it? <laughs> So anyway, I'd never read any Patrick Cavana before. I'm really glad that I have now. And I think it's definitely a worthy addition in the Penguin Mini Modern Classics. I like the fact that it is both effectively classical poetry, but it's also modern poetry. I think you can really see this as a step between classical and modern poetry. And you don't get enough of that, really, because it tends to be two different camps. You either like one or the other. And I think this is a great little way to bridge the gap. All in all, then, I'm going to give this... 
I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5. I did enjoy the poetry here. I think it was just the right amount as well. I don't think I would have wanted any more. I don't know whether I'm even going to read a full-length collection of Patrick Cavanagh's work. But I am glad that I read this. And like I say, the fact that it fits almost between classical and modern poetry makes it the kind of book that has quite a widespread appeal, which I think is what you want for these Penguin Mini Moderns. And so if even if you're not much of a poetry fan or if you only like one type of poetry, I think it's worth worth giving this a shot. So yeah. So there we have it. That's what I thought of The Great Hunger by Patrick Kavanagh. Don't forget to let me know in the comments what you think of this book, if you've read it or his work. I'm really butchering this. I, I, I don't know how to actually say his name. But yeah, Patrick Kavanagh, The Great Hunger. I enjoyed it. So yeah, let me know in the comments if you've read this book. Uh, if not, are you going to read it? Hit the like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.